Good afternoon on this Monday, April 21st. I'm Nuna Nofed and these are today's headlines. Sida Jaja meets Qatar Party Chief Amin Jamayel handing over the presidential program of her husband, Lebanese Forces Leader Samir Jaja. Syrian warplanes drop barrel bombs on the neighborhood of Al Fardus in Aleppo city, killing at least 40. And Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says that Kiev is crudely violating a Geneva deal struck to ease tensions. Interior Minister Nuhad al mashnu says that a plan to rescue an East Lebanon village that has been cut off from the rest of the country by Syrian troops will go into effect starting tomorrow. He said in a press conference that security plan for Tfail village will be launched with the participation of the Lebanese army and the internal security forces, the general security and the Red Cross, which will work to evacuate the wounded. He added that they have also contacted Hezbollah and coordinated with the party to evacuate the Syrian families outside the town after efforts to contact the Syrian regime and the opposition proved futile. Mishnu said that if the plan did not work, he would take the case to the cabinet and file a complaint to the United Nations Security Council over the besieged village. Lebanese Forces MP Strida Jaja hands over the presidential program of her husband, LF leader Samir Jaja, to the Kitaib party chief, Amin Jmail, stressing the unity of the March 14 alliance regarding the presidential polls. She stated after meeting Jmail at Big Faya, the March 14 alliance will be united in its stance over the elections. The alliance will stand behind one candidate when it heads to the parliamentary session on Wednesday. Jaja describes her meeting with Jmail as positive, saying that the two sides highlighted the importance of the elections. Parliament is scheduled to convene on Wednesday in order to hold the polls amid concerns that the needed quorum will not be met. Fatah al-Islam official Bilal Badr's bodyguard was shot earlier this morning in the refugee camp of Ain al-Hilwi outside the coastal city of Saida in the south of the country. At least one gunman opened fire at Ali Khalil in the Safsaf neighborhood of the camp wounding him in the head. Khalil was then transferred to a medical center inside the camp, but Islamist officials then decided to move him to Labib Medical Center outside the camp because he was in a critical condition. He later died of his wounds. Khalil was a bodyguard for Badr, an official with the radical Islamist Fatah al-Islam group, and the nephew of Jind al-Sham official Usama al-Shahabi. He was also wanted by the Lebanese authorities. Security sources say that a meeting was being held between Shahabi and Badr in the Safsaf neighborhood shortly before the incident. This is the killing that comes just weeks after a Sunni sheikh was fatally shot in Ain al-Hilwi as well. The dead body of a young woman was found on Sunday in the Kisirwan area of Uqaybe, a day after she went missing from the nearby town of Ajaltun. The corpse of young woman Stephanie Jack Zurbi, who was 21, was discovered in the Uqaybe area after she died in mysterious circumstances. Now, the National News Agency says security forces launched a probe into the case in a bid to determine exactly what happened. But they said Stephanie had left her father's house in Ajaltun for an unknown destination without taking her cell phone with her and without saying where she was going. Her family revealed to Future TV that she might have passed by a pharmacy to purchase antidepressants. And they also said that she reportedly suffered of depression since the death of her mother last July. Batul, a mother of three, was admitted into an intensive care unit after her husband beat her up and left her along with her child on the side of road in the northern city of Tripoli. She was left bleeding in the street for several hours after she was assaulted. The blood on her face drew the attention of a passerby who took her to the police station. She told officials that an elderly man had hit her with a gas canister, but witnesses state that it was not the first time she had been assaulted at the hands of her husband. Activists claim that Syrian warplanes have targeted the neighborhood of Al-Fardus in Aleppo city with barrel bombs, killing at least 40. The video posted on YouTube shows severe damage on buildings and the street while firefighters extinguished the fire. The number of casualties remains unclear. At least 10 people were also killed in another barrel bomb attack in the suburb of Beidin, according to activists. In another area, a pair of mortar shells hit near the parliament building in central Damascus, killing five. Syrian state media says the mortars struck some 100 meters from the parliament in the Salehiya area of the Syrian capital. No one immediately claimed responsibility for the attack, but Syrian rebels often fire mortar shells into government-controlled areas of Damascus. And Syria's parliamentary speaker, Mohammed Jihad al-Laham, has announced that Syria will hold presidential elections and are expected to return 
President Bashar al-Assad to office on June the 3rd. The first presidential election will be held amid a civil war that has killed more than 150,000 people. Assad, whose term ends on July 17th, is widely expected to run and win another seven-year term in office despite the conflict. Coming up next, Ellen DeGeneres shares some bad Easter photos from her fans. Stay with us for more after the break. Welcome back. Palestinian militants in the Gaza Strip fired three rockets into Israel on but caused no casualties or property damage, according to an army statement. It also added that the projectiles fell in the Negev Desert region of southern Israel. The attack comes during a very public holiday in Israel, marking the last day of the Jewish festival of Passover. In other regional news, three Al-Qaeda suspects, including an alleged senior militant, were killed in a drone strike in southern Yemen. The attack is the latest in an intensified air campaign that has killed more than 40 suspected Al-Qaeda militants. This includes 30 just yesterday alone, days after the jihadist network's Yemen affiliate vowed to fight against Western crusaders. The United States is the only country operating drones over Yemen, but U.S. officials rarely acknowledge the covert drone program. Yemen's Interior Ministry, meanwhile, said that 10 people suspected of wanting to join al-Qaeda have been arrested at a security roadblock in Shabwa. Yemen's President Abdullah Mansour Hadi defended the use of drones despite criticism from rights group concerned about civilian casualties. Former Foreign Minister Abdullah Abdullah leads the race to become Afghanistan's next president, according to the latest official tally of votes, but is short of an outright majority. Afghanistan's Independent Election Commission says initial results based on almost 50 percent of the vote from the 34 provinces show Abdullah in the lead with a 44.4 percent. Abdullah is followed by academic Ashraf Ghani, who obtained a 33 percent share of the ballots. Obtaining less than half the votes in the first round would mean the top two candidates going up against each other in a second round of elections. Afghanistan's allies have hailed the April 5th vote as a success because of the high turnout and the absence of any major attacks on polling day. However, evidence has subsequently emerged of widespread fraud. The final first round results will be released on May 14th and a runoff, if needed, will take place in the late of May. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says that a deadly gun battle in East Ukraine is proof that Ukraine is crudely violating a deal struck in the Swiss city of Geneva to ease tensions. This comes after three pro-Russians were killed on Sunday in an exchange of fire with unknown attackers at a checkpoint set up by pro-Russians near the town of Slovyanysk. The armed clash appears to be the first since an international agreement was reached last week in Geneva to ease tensions in eastern Ukraine, where pro-Russian supporters have seized government buildings in at least 10 cities. Lavrov states that the Easter truce has been violated, and this provocation testifies to the lack of will on the part of the Kiev authorities to rein in and disarm nationalists and extremists. Nepal's mountaineers have threatened to stop work in seven days unless compensation of $10,000 is paid to the families of colleagues killed, injured or missing after last week's Everest avalanche. The ultimatum was among a series of demands issued by the Nepal's Mountaineers Association. Others include a memorial to the dead, the doubling of insurance cover to $20,000 and medical bills paid for by the government. The government had earlier announced a payment of $400 to the victims' families to cover funeral costs, a payment dismissed as insufficient by the association. The community says that if the demands are not met, they will launch strong protests for the sake of daily bread of the Sherpa community. At least 13 guys were killed and three others seriously injured in the avalanche on Humbu Icefall. The men were trying to fix ropes and crack snow and ice to carve out a route for foreign climbers. Now for news around the world in brief. A Malaysia airline planes with 160 people abroad, aboard was forced to make an emergency landing in Kuala Lumpur in another blow to its safety image after the loss of flight MH370. Flight MH192, bound for Bangalore in India, turned back to Kuala Lumpur after it was discovered that a tire had burst on takeoff. The airline says that safety is of utmost priority to Malaysia Airlines as the aircraft was required to turn back to Kuala Lumpur. The airline says tire debris discovered on the runway had led to the decision to bring the Boeing back. Fresh violence erupts in the Venezuelan capital of Caracas between police and opponents of President Nicolas Maduro. Masked protesters burn effigies of the president after a rally called Resurrection of Democracy. Police responded to patrol bombs in the Chachao district with tear gas and water cannon. 
more than 40 have been died and violent protests in February and hundreds of people have been arrested. The South Korean president says that the behavior of the captain and crew of the capsized ferry with 476 people on board was unacceptable and tantamount to murder. He says that his and all South Koreans' hearts have been broken and filled with shock and anger after the incident. The ferry Seoul sank in 27 meters of water in calm seas as it sailed from Incheon to the northwestern southern city of Juju. The captain was arrested along with the helmsman and the ship's relatively inexperienced third officer. And one of my favorite talk show hosts, Ellen Generous, shared some very bad Easter photos that her fans sent to her. Here they are. So Easter uh, Sunday, a lot of people are going to be taking photos. In fact, a lot of you already sent some in. I want to show some of our favorites we've got for our segment, Easter Photo Oh Nos. that song off. I can't. <laughs> this comes in from Carrie Aguilar from Canton, Georgia. Hi, Ellen. My sister and I took this Easter photo in 1974. Uh, wow. That's a scary yeah. rabbit. Yeah. You remember the 1970s Easter monster, right? That was... <laughs> he was around for a while. Diane, uh, Diana Beerer in Gerard Fort, Pennsylvania. Talk about creepy, scary Easter bunnies. <laughs> the baby's scared to death. Oh, that's horrible. I don't trust anyone with an ascot and no pants anyway, so. Barbara Hammond in York, South Carolina. My friend posted this on Facebook. It was too funny not to send. Anal egg hunt. No, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> you could not pay me. It's, it doesn't matter that it's free. It's, I don't want to go. <laughs> Kelly Warner in Hamilton, New Jersey. To this day, this is by far my favorite picture of myself. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want the Easter Bunny to be scary, just give him some eyes, maybe, before you sit a child on the lap. That is so horrible. All right, if you have any wonderfully terrible Easter photos this week, send them to me because our friends at Shutterfly are going to give away $5,000 to the best one. So put your kid on a lap of a... This marks the end of our bulletin for today. Now for a reminder of our top stories. Sida Jaja meets Kitab party leader Amin Jmey and hands over the presidential program of Lebanese forces leader Samir Jaja. Syrian warplanes drop barrel bombs on the neighborhood of Al Fadus in Aleppo City, killing at least 40. And Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says that Kiev is crudely violating a Geneva deal struck to ease tensions. Well, those were your top stories for this Monday on Future Television in Beirut. I'm Nina Nofal, wishing you happy holidays.